Monty returned to England and continued to write to Lucien with his characteristic simplicity and also with deep affection. Many of the letters are quite strange because they could easily be interpreted as love letters. Now, I would attribute this to the fact that uh, he was always using a very simple vocabulary. When he liked somebody, he, he, he constantly wrote and talked about love, not just to me, to his ADCs, to his foreign officers. It was love all over the place. His father was a bishop and I'm sure was talking of love a great deal in a religious way. So he, he misused the word a lot. And this is why he had only one word uh, for the people he liked, and this was love. Holidays with Lucien could only be happy interludes. The reality was that two years after the war, Monty and his son David still had no home. Everything we'd had was in store and had been bombed in Portsmouth, and so he really had no home and no possessions. There had been a lot of suggestions at the time that uh, my father might have expected a sort of stately home like Marlborough or Wellington uh, as a conquering hero returns, but that never happened. He bought this derelict building and then ran into enormous difficulties of even being allowed to convert it into a house. And he was refused planning commission and he had to appeal right up to the prime minister and there was a tremendous sort of furore. He was only able to build his home when the Australian government heard of his plight and sent a shipment of timber. He was now in charge of Britain's peacetime army, a role needing diplomacy intact. He was constantly at loggerheads with Attlee's Labour government. Inevitably, he got his fingers burned. He was very naughty because he liked to try and interfere in politics about which he knew nothing. and. Um, not merely foreign politics. He bored Churchill to tears by talking to him about Greece and Turkey, about which Monty knew nothing. But on one particular occasion, there was real trouble because he tried to lobby the shadow cabinet. Although he was CIGS and uh, Labour government was in power, he tried to lobby the, the shadow cabinet about some matter. I think it had something to do with recruiting or national service. And Churchill was furious, and he sent him a message to say that it would be very much better if the CIGS um, kept his uh, mind on military affairs and military matters and didn't try to interfere in politics, which were not his business. The Russian threat to Berlin in 1948 finally gave the government the opportunity they'd been looking for. Monty was packed off to Paris to set up the Western Defence Union. For the next ten years, he devoted his still enormous energies to laying the foundations of what became NATO. Communism is a religion. It is anti-Christian, it is retrograde, it is immoral. And as a Christian... <coughs> Monty had found a new enemy to fight. As a Christian soldier, I declare myself an enemy of communism and all that it stands for. At home, he remained hugely popular. And I will have great pleasure in presenting Viscount Montgomery with this emblem from the old town, the Prince Albert Winkle Club. I want to, I want to thank you for making me a member of the Winkle Club. I must, uh, I'll be quite frank with you, i never heard of the Winkle Club before. But I, I'm, that's my mistake. I'm now very glad to be a member of it. And I'm told that if I ever come to Hastings without this Winkle, there'll be a big fine. Is that right? That's right, yes. True. Well, I shall carry this Winkle always. Well, I hope you'll remember, these old Winklers are certain to try and catch him out. Now, gentlemen, this is the anniversary of the Battle of Alamey. And I'm delighted to welcome in this hall such a large gathering of all those who... He could also bask in the continuing devotion shown by men of his old 8th Army.
1958, he finally retired at the age of 70, after 50 years of continuous military service. Now, I'm going out of business. And most people will say, I've heard a lot of people say, when they go out of business, this is the saddest day of my life. But from my point of view, it's the best day I've ever had. I'm delighted to go. And I go with complete satisfaction to myself, anyhow. I'm delighted to go. I've had enough. I want now to go and be quiet. And live Far from life. being quiet, he was soon speaking on American television, causing a public outcry. In the United States, my observations would be that the leaders, your leaders over there, are people who are not awfully well. Mr. Dulles, whom I, Pastor Dulles, whom I like very much indeed, like he's an awfully nice chap, very decent chap, is in hospital with cancer. Your president has had three very serious illnesses, very serious heart attack, this ileitis and a stroke. The head of your State Department today walks about on two crutches and then he can't walk properly. Oh my God. I know awfully well from my life as a military person that you can't win battles unless you are feeling very well. There was more to come. He went to some very important dinner and he had to make a speech in which he gave forth his views on the world situation and unwisely, I think, said, Adenauer, of course, is finished and he should be given a weed killer. Well, this, of course, infuriated the world press and infuriated everyone, <laughs> but uh, he didn't mind. He, he, he really meant it. As always, he loved to stir up trouble. When he published his memoirs, he was determined to tell his story of the war, whatever the consequences. One time when he was staying with me, he told me that uh, he was writing his memoirs and he would like to give me a chapter to read uh, in bed that night and then we'd discuss it at breakfast, uh, which he did, and it was uh, fascinating to read it. But he had said some very unkind things about Eisenhower. And uh, not about Eisenhower as the supreme commander, but uh, as Eisenhower as the commander in chief. I said, sir, you, you can't publish this till Eisenhower's dead. Why not? I said, well, sir, the, the Americans won't like this. He said, it's the truth. And I said, well, I'm not going to argue with you and discuss whether it's the truth or not. He's the president of the United States. If you publish this, you'll never go back to the United States, and they'll hate you for it. He said he was going to publish it. He did publish it. He never went back to the States. Eisenhower never spoke to him again. He had been given the freedom of the city of Montgomery, Alabama. I don't know whether this has ever happened in history before. They took it away from him. He just couldn't stop. I never said Eisenhower was a bad general. Never. You can't find that anywhere in the book. I just said I didn't agree with his uh, way he did his stuff. I just uh, told the story of the Ardennes. Finish. I didn't say that uh, Badley had lost control which one could have said, I suppose. I didn't say that. Well, you know what happened, of course. You know what happened. 80,000 American boys were killed and wounded. And of course, that didn't endear me to the American generals when what happened was what I said would happen. I think that it's a question of wisdom. And uh, you've got to remember that in this, in handling world problems, I think you must remember that the British have the experience of centuries. The United States has the experience of decades. And uh, I would say that you have quite a bit to learn. Gradually, even the British press lost patience with this old soldier who'd become a caricature of himself. Even his friendship with Lucien cooled. The schoolboy had grown up. He was already, I guess, in his early 70s or close to that and uh, he just kept uh, telling everybody how fit he was uh, so he tested my eyesight with an airplane disappearing and he tested my the way I was hearing and so on and I was invariably far inferior to him and that made him very happy and then we went on a, on a walk uh, 
uh, through Murren, Monty with his uh, age-old little cane, which he uh, always had in his hands. And uh, now the, the military uh, sense of orderliness came through with great vigor. Uh, Monty just couldn't have it that there was dog excrement or empty cigarette packs on the trail. Uh, just like an expert golfer, he would just catapult these out of the way. Uh, another element which struck me was that he was constantly looking for straight lines everywhere. Uh, he, he, he just checked the logs in front of people's houses to see whether they were nicely aligned and he commented how nicely the wash was, was hung up on the, on the lines outside of people's houses. He was really the military, the impersonation of a military person. In his final years, he increasingly shut himself away at his Hampshire mill, which became a place of pilgrimage for his old comrades. I went along and rang the bell, and the housekeeper came down, and uh, she said, he's in bed. Go up. So I went up, and there he was lying in bed, looking very, very ill indeed. And obviously in, in great pain, he said, uh, my back's hurting, Charles. And I said, well, can I do anything? Can I lift you up? He said, no. You better go. When I went into the, the bedroom, I said, what is troubling you, Field Marshal? And he said, well, it can't be long now before I go over, to, over the Jordan. He never used the word before I die, never, never, as I knew. And uh, I've got to meet all those soldiers that I killed at Alamein, and then I killed at Normandy, but particularly at Alamein. All I could say was, uh, Field Marshal, we all knew that uh, there had to be victory, that some people would be killed, but you did your utmost to reduce the numbers uh, to as small as possible. You've nothing, nothing to worry about when you get over Jordan. They'll be overjoyed to see you. <laughs>